Welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode of Hero Hero Go Show. I, as always, am Bo Ransdell, your host for these proceedings. Joining me for a series that continues to get longer by the day. Uh, one Derek Bourgeois. How are you, sir? I'm pretty good, and I'm very excited to talk about this interesting series that we discovered so yeah. far. Okay, so first of all, let me think the listeners overall here because several people reached out and were like hey man i think i got a line on this thing uh so we found uh of course chakushin Ari, the uh the 2005 television series of uh one miss call and we're able to to get our hands on it uh like i said there's no streaming service there's no dvd you can buy that we could find or anything it's really uh, strangely difficult to come by for something that seems relatively popular in in the grand scheme of of things, but you know, it, also why on earth would it? You know, that's the other question you have to ask yourself. Is like, yeah, you know, for weirdos like us, of course we're like, why why you this on Blu-ray? But you know, yeah, yeah, how many Blu-ray. people? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like it could have been released on like. Blu-ray and standard def, like a lot of those. Uh, who company does that? Disco Tech, I yeah. think, does a lot of those. Yeah, um, I, but I'm fine with it. Like I bought it because I'm a, a an idiot. Ended up with a like Chinese bootleg of Alligator recently. So look, I've made bad decisions, Derek. This isn't didn't this isn't the first time nor will it be the last but um yeah we, so we ended up getting uh, a copy of the show so thanks again to everyone who reached out and was like hey here here you go if you got if you if you dumb dumbs want to talk about this here it is um so uh so yes much appreciated and and you guys uh not to be gender specific you folks at home are the absolute best. So thanks very much. And and so I want to bring this up too before we get started, Derek, because it's yet another uh like aimless pursuit of mine. Mm-hmm. So one miss call, uh the 2003 uh film, the the, the Takashi Miike uh film, that joint yep. um is based on as you read it it's based on a novel yep and that novel is written by hang on let me do some quick research here um so it's done by yasushi uh, akimoto is the guy's name so the film says hey the this is based on a novel when I look at a couple of other sources, it says, oh, yeah, the novel actually, like, uh, Akimoto conceived of One Miss Call. And then when the novel apparently was written concurrently with the production of the film, I think. So, again, this is all real shady. And, and there's a, a manga of one miss call one and two that dark horse published so that's readily available but i could not for the life of me find actual evidence that there is an honest to goodness novel called one miss call certainly not translated into english but i can't even find good information about the japanese version of it the way that you're describing it, it sounds like it's an Arthur C. Clarke situation where he wrote the novel 2001 while he was making the movie. Maybe so, but you would like, I'm just curious because one of the things that we'll talk about here is that the television one miss call is kind of a remake of the first movie or maybe just a larger adaptation of the novel. I'm not sure which of those is true. Yeah, that's interesting for Be- sure. Because they're especially at the point we'll get to where because this is ten episodes and because every episode is forty five minutes long, we're actually going to carve up our discussion of the TV series into the first five episodes and then the back five in the the following episode. And then, folks, I swear to God, we're going to get around to doing one miss call final. Uh, to wrap this series up, but this television series really captured my imagination. And I, 
I wish I could bring the listeners a little more information about it. It's just a little bit hard to come by. Yeah, like we were, we were even lucky just to find a copy of this. Right. And and so this journey I'm on to find a copy of the uh, Akimoto novel, not the manga, the novel, because the, the, the manga came out after uh, One Miss Call 2 or maybe around the time One Miss Call 2 was released, uh, in two th- also in 2005, uh, right along with the television series. So this is kind of one miss call the original movie again uh, up to a certain point like i'll be honest with you i haven't finished this thing yet because it's 45 minute episodes which caught me off guard Uh, yeah and at first i was like okay well we'll watch a couple of these and you know get a sense of it we can kind of talk about what what the show is uh but then i started watching i was like you know what i just kind of want to get into this um because I will I will tell you right now, Derek, I'm not going to hide anything. I'm an open book. Um, I <laughs> A hard to find Japanese open book. Uh, but I I like this more than One Miss Call 2 already. Actually, ironically enough, the thing that I said <laughs> hilariously enough that they should have followed in One Miss Call 2 actually happens in this TV show where you follow a reporter and a detective character. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And uh, all right, so without further ado, we'll we'll get into it. Uh the first episode is the one I have the least notes on just because I was like, well, you know, we're we're not really going to talk about this in any large detail. We're just going to kind of do an umbrella conversation about it. And then after the first episode, I was like, all right, let me l- let me start taking some notes cuz some crazy shit is happening. Uh, and I won't remember all of the crazy shit as it happens. Um, but we are introduced to Yumi, who is, uh, our main character. Essentially, she is, um, working as a proofreader at a paper, but she's really, she's not good with people, uh, but she's really good at her job and she kind of steps on some toes. So they bust her down to a group called Yoku May Watch, which is sort of the tabloid part of the paper, it seems like. I mean, they're all a bunch of weirdos and goofballs. Yeah, it's kind of like, they're kind of like website tabloid newspaper. That's the way I describe it. Yeah, yeah. And, And worth noting that the translation for these episodes is real Google translator. So sometimes it's pretty dead on. It feels like, and there are times where you're like, I think I get the gist of this. Yeah. But also I, I'm not exactly sure what they're saying here. Um, but I also kind of love that. Yeah. It it feels right for this type of, like every time, like they were in the high school areas of the show, go a little off head uh you know they didn't talk about students as a whole they're like the student yeah the student <laughs> yeah there yes there there are a lot of translations like that when um especially with some of the d- detective questioning I, I put this all over social media because i thought it was just the best but it was it was when one of the detectives i think it's sendo actually who's questioning some girls about uh this young lady what caught fire in the first episode yes and the line as it's written is something like so the spark catch fire on her dress and then she fall downstairs and (laughs) and it's like yeah i understand what that's saying that's also not right and kind of hilarious uh but i really enjoyed it like every time i get a little bored in this series Either the Yoku may watch will show up and something wonderful will happen, or there will just be a mistranslation that is really funny and kind of keeps me like the, tr- the bad translation keeps me as entertained as some of the stuff happening on screen. Yeah. Um, but God bless them. Thank God somebody did it. Otherwise we would be lost. You know, we, it truly would be. I, I here's what I think happened based uh, on the fact that I can count to five in Japanese. Um, oh. So <laughs> anyway, 
there's uh, so there's Yumi who yeah she gets busted down to Yokomai Watch. Yokomai Watch is like you said they're 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 sort of a website version of of Toto Publications is where they all work, and it's there's a nerd, there's kind of a slutty girl, there's uh sort of a, like almost an idol kind of girl. Like Japanese pop idol kind of kind of style, uh-huh. that sort of Lolita look almost. Uh, there's the editor who's like a surly dude who constantly is talking about all the women he's fucking and smokes bongs. And so, yeah, it's, it just takes giant bong rips throughout the show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's just got something like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, um, exactly. He's uh, that character. I think is wonderful. Um, and yeah, there are a couple of other characters in this Yokame watch, but those are the sort of main ones. And, um, anyway, so Yumi hooks up with them in time to get a whiff of a story where there was originally the, the whole show starts with a girl drowning in a pool and, and ending up with a red ro- or a rose tattoo on her hand. Yeah. Uh, after getting the one missed call, uh, phone call. And so that's sort of what sets everything off. And then the the ep, the first episode is really about the mystery of this girl who catches fire, uh, as the the bad translation suggested. Uh, Spark caught her dress, and then she catch on fire and fall downstairs, and that's what happens. And and sort of the whole first episode is the main detective, a guy named Sendo. Uh, hooking up with Yumi to kind of investigate what's happened here. And also with that is this notion of, hey, the girl who died, um, I think her name is Sakoto, uh, that she got this one missed call, phone call, and before she died. Mm. And, and so everybody's like, oh, shit. Uh, you know, like Yumi thinks that there could be this curse thing. Sendo clearly knows some shit he's not saying. And even where we are in in the series now, like there's some stuff Sendo knows that he still is not saying. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of fun. Like, it's, it's weird that the first episode, and actually the whole show, is this weird kind of procedural where it's like, okay, here's the, the the potential victim in this episode, and here are all the characters trying to either prevent that from happening or try to figure out what the hell happened. And and so this first episode is the story of this girl who catches fire. But, Derek, what happens is the uh <laughs> the girl was super popular, and one of the girls in their clique sets up this whole like Rube Goldberg assassination plot with like phosphorus or something. Yeah. So that when, when this girl like flicks her lighter or uh, hits a spark or something, it, it causes her to catch fire and she goes up in a pillar of flame and then falls off uh, these stairs, falls down some stairs. It's it's really good. It's glorious fashion. You know, that whole, like, high school drama shit just reminds me of Tomie beginning. Man, so there's, this isn't like Tomie. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it does have that, like, another face kind of, like, oh, this is definitely Japanese television uh, yeah. kind of vibe to it. Um, and all Japanese television pretty much looks like this. So if you are a fan of Japanese entertainment, uh, and that extends to live action television you know the kind of video that we're talking about here uh if you don't think of any sitcom from like 1984 and it kind of looks like that yeah um it's unforgiving man it like the lighting no matter how you light it it doesn't ever look like a real cinematic thing it's really bad uh i it's like it it has its own charm and i've kind of grown to appreciate it not just from this show but just other japanese television stuff uh-huh. uh, or just some movies you know some movies were were made for tv like another face and stuff like that but um it's it's striking like it doesn't quite look like any other format uh, yeah for sure uh 
you know, even, especially when they try to recreate a scene from the movie later, but we'll get into that when we get into it, you know. Yeah, but God bless them for trying. Like, they direct the shit out of this show. Yeah. Like, they're going for it. And that's another thing that I kind of like over One Miss Call 2. Now that, like, I don't want to bag on One Miss Call 2 uh, all the time here, but for trying to do a, a film or a story set in this One Miss Call universe and try to highlight, like, the love story and the emotions and, and the characters and that kind of thing that I just feel like the television series does a better job with all of that. Um, yeah. And it's more fun. Like the Yokobe watch stuff is downright silly. Yeah. It's my, some of my favorite parts of the show involve like any car- involvement of the, the TV news crew characters, you know, it's like they just bring like, you know, just when she enters that like office building that they all hang in, like oh no, it's, what are they going to be doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I th- I think I sent you this picture, but it's it's when uh one of the I think his name is o- Oyama Oyahama, uh the the nerdy one when Yumi first shows up, he's like, holy shit, are you here to bring my you know uh m- my Japanese Japanese idol uh model? that I'm definitely going to jerk off to later. <laughs> is that, is that what you're here to deliver? And she's like, <laughs> what? Um, he doesn't say he's definitely going to jerk off to it, but we all know what's going on here. Um, also, Oh, what's her name? Uh, the, the actress who plays, um, Yumi, uh, an actress named Ray Kiku, Kiku Kawa is her name. Um, is a model and an actress, but she's genuinely really good in this. She's a lot of fun to follow. Yeah, I, I, I she has good like a uh, facial acting too, especially when she's reacting to like Sendo or like uh, any of her like news reporter crewmates. You know, it's great. Yeah, and there, there's there's uh, so Sendo as a character who's the main detective. One of my favorite things about this character is he's all like bluster and what a great detective he is. But anytime like you got to run after a perp or actually like bust into a room or anything, complete coward, like absolutely refuses to go first in any situation. He's a real like Burke from aliens. Only he's not a total asshole. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like there, there's one scene when he and Ray are investigating somewhere and it's like a closed door that needs to be opened and he just grabs his stomach and just goes, Oh no, no, no. Oh no. And and she's like, all right, fine. Fuck it. I'll go. Uh, Um, but I like the, all the characters have little stuff like that about them. Like Yumi as a character is kind of abrasive. She's not overly friendly or anything. And I kind of like that all of these characters feel they're they're, like, they're all heightened and they're all kind of archetypes and whatnot, but they're, they're, there's a, a reality to all of them and a layer to, or or multiple layers to all of them uh, in a way that I can really appreciate. And it makes the, the journey through the show genuinely good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, oh, also the the other character that we've got to mention from episode one is uh, a guy whose name I still can't re- remember. I think it's uh, I think it's Aquino is the guy's name, but I keep calling him Johnny Walnuts because he's constantly got walnuts that he's cracking and whatnot. <laughs> um. So anyway, forgive me when I call this guy Johnny Walnuts. But anyway, so we learn that uh, back to the plot of the first episode. Yeah, we learn that this mean girl. Uh, set up this murder and then when she's confronted with like Yumi and Sendo are like hey you did this um, she tells all her friends like oh these bitches wanted me to Um, (laughs) you know like let's not let's not pretend that anybody was really a big fan of this girl that got set on fire yeah Um, but then the the girl in question who is named Satoko Satoko gets a one miss call, except this time it's for real. And the first episode ends with her running off with the one miss call ringing. 
yeah. as, as like Sendo and Yumi are, are kind of watching. So now we're into a realm where I actually have notes and hopefully this will make more sense. So um, Satoko immediately dies in the second episode with some rebar through the ear after thinking that she might get got by a train. Um, yeah. yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say, uh, I actually kind of like that because uh, I thought it was going to be like kind of a remake of like a, you know, the train death from the first movie. And I'm kind of, you know, it's kind of like, you know, they don't have that budget to do that type of death. So I'm kind of happy they didn't try to go that route. And uh, I was kind of like, oh, that was a nice kill with Reaper. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, nice and simple. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's a pretty good like camera trick of it, like going through her ear and, and her dying pretty quick. Um, and, but she has a rose tattoo on her palm too, uh, when she dies and instead of, you know, dismembered arms, dialing a phone number, we get a rose tattoo. It's fine. It's fine. Um, and the, uh, then Johnny Walnuts we learn is going back to, uh, his old school where he's going to be a teacher for a while. Um, Yumi threatens to quit Yokome watch because she's like, you guys are a bunch of yellow journalists. Um, but then a girl named Ryoko shows up and she's like, Hey, is this Yokome watch? Because I got a one missed call. And, uh, so they're like, okay, well, what we're going to do then is, is we're going to film this girl 24 hours a day and and get like a document of whether or not this curse is real. But, but uh, it, while they're debating, and this is true, whether or not to include bathroom time and all of that, uh, Ryoko, yes. <laughs> Ryoko just runs off. Yeah, she takes the girl and like get the fuck out of here. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yumi and Ryoko beat feet, and uh, Sendo gets a call from Yumi, and she's like, "Hey, I've got Ryoko with me," and so he meets him at this club that we will see uh, a couple of times throughout the, the series, where there is a character who is just like the sexy hostess. Yeah, that just kind of hangs out doesn't really play much of a part she's just always there at the club yeah this, is the, this club is the lost club of twin peaks it man it kind of is because the it's the same bartender who's always there every now and again there'll be like the lady bartender and then sexy hostess and that's kind of it all the time and every time somebody goes to a bar it's this bar yeah um Anyway, it's again one of the reasons why uh, this is so so damn charming, and uh, but yeah, so they they go to this uh, Twin Peaks club, and um, Sindo is like, you know, I will absolutely protect you. Yeah, you know, we will get through this together. And <laughs> they go to her place where they find the door open, and Sindo has to like take his nervous pill to muster the courage to go inside first. Um, but once inside, they find a bomb, uh, which explodes like he has to, uh, Sendo has to rush Ryoko outside and bada bing, bada boom. The, the place blows up. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty exciting. All things being equal. And, uh, anyway, so it turns out this one missed call that she got is 36 hours in the future. Uh, Ryoko, meanwhile, is like, you know, I've deleted all the numbers from my phone, except one, my ex-boyfriend. You know, if you got in touch with him and let him know that I was in kind of a jam, that wouldn't be the worst thing that ever happened. Uh, so, Yumi is going to go uh, on a search for this guy named Yoshioko, who is her ex, Ryoko's ex. And he's like, hey, I'm going to medical school or something. And also, curses aren't real, and I already broke up with her once. So, bye. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good, you know, it's kind of crazy. Like, uh, yeah, it was kind of weird when they actually go into this a little bit more later when the reveal happens of what she was actually doing, and it's kind of fucked up. Yeah, She's it's crazy. Real. Girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's super fucked up. So. <laughs> so 
uh there's some stuff happening at the school where johnny walnuts um is he meets up with this girl named sakaya kind of our wednesday adams of of the show Um, she is wednesday i wrote that down (laughs) nice uh so i'm sorry sayaka is her name sayaka uh and she's playing fur elise like resident evil style in a classroom and he like walks by and he's like, oh, my God, he has like this weird flashback, which lets us know that he's got some heinous shit that happened at this school, you know, sometime in the past. You know, this school is the most fucked up school ever, because one, they have like a teacher that's dressed like a scientist the whole show, <laughs> you know, lab coat on. And then, yeah. the, and, the, and then the headmaster slash principal, when he just walks in with that bow tie. You know shit's going to go down with that character later. He, Yeah, he looks like a Yakuza boss from another movie <laughs> where, like, if somebody came in and, and demanded, or and he demanded that they cut off their pinky, it would be totally in line with this character. Yeah, you know, Lab Coat's teacher is just taking students and doing experiments down in the base. <laughs> right, yeah, it just becomes the horrors of malformed men. Um <laughs> <laughs> a, sh- a movie we will probably do at some point on this show um anyway so uh sayaka is like hey i heard that every 10 years in this joint a curse befalls the school and uh there's a person with a rose tattoo i think it is has to spend the night in the school or else tragedy befalls everybody or something I'm not a like I'm I'm not a hundred percent on the details of exactly how this curse initializes or works. Even you know, yeah, you know, because uh, we're still in the middle of the show, and you know, they they haven't really explained it yet in detail more. But uh, yeah, it's hard to tell if some of that's translation too. That's true too. You know, if like, hey, maybe this is a little clearer if I actually you know spoke the language of the show that I'm watching. Uh, but that also seems hard. Yeah. Um, like I said, I can count to actually, I'll tell you what I can get all the way to seven these days, you know, seven is Nana and that's just not hard. Um, so anyway, uh, Wednesday Adams is, uh, going to be a big player in all of this. Um, Sendo ends up calling Yumi to say like, Hey, I got to go to police HQ while Ryoko and Yumi hang out at uh, Yokome Watch. And when they get there, the staff is mostly drunk <laughs> and kind of partying while Ryoko is just sitting on a couch being live streamed. <laughs> and so they kind of convince Yumi to have a couple of drinks and then cut to the next morning after everyone's passed out and Ryoko is gone again. Oh, there goes Ryoko. We're going to go find her. Right. You know? So, um, meanwhile, uh, they, they they check the video and it looks like she got a call and then walked off in some kind of trance. And so Sindo and Yumi go to an acoustic lab where the they analyze the one missed call that Ryoko got. And uh, Sindo... Um, is like, okay, I got, you know, the, this all seems like, uh, it's some sort of park that she's in. And so Sendo then goes to try to find this park while Yumi meets Yoshioko again, who had been called by Ryoko. And so they're all kind of converging on this park and then they find her. And we hear some bells tolling like we do in her one missed call. Her one missed call is like you hear these bells and then there's an explosion and and she screams. And so everybody kind of finds her at this park with the bells tolling, but then there's no explosion. And meanwhile, acoustic lab guy calls and says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That voicemail was a total fake. Like the number got spoofed and everything. Uh, and this whole, like the explosion was added after the fact to this recording. (laughs) Um, so this is all bullshit. And as you suggested earlier, it turns out that the actual story here is that, uh, poor Ryoko 
was feeling a little down because Yoshioko took off on her. So she was faking all this to try to get him back. Yeah, crazy girl. She's up there with like one of those girls from a Lifetime movie. Right. <laughs> yeah, she's she's also dating a teacher and is <laughs> pregnant at 17. Uh, but, all right, so she does, however get uh, uh a, a call ryoko does and she um calls yumi is like no 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 seriously i got a real uh for realsies death call this time and then she just wanders out into the street uh where a truck starts rolling backwards and i was like are they gonna hit a dummy because that would be okay with me if this truck just rolled over a, a ryoko dummy but instead, what happens is kind of better. She uh, gets omened. It's a hundred percent the David Warner death from the omen. Yeah, um, and that's what happens. Uh, glass plane pain comes out of a truck, cuts her head off. Um, then later at the crime scene, Sendo discovers she has this rose tattoo on her hand also. And then we learn that at this school, a single red rose has been delivered to uh sakaya who says oh i'm the sacrifice this time while johnny walnuts is like oh shit it's starting again it has begun yeah and so our cliffhanger for this episode because they're they all end on cliffhangers is sendo getting a call from himself from the future but there's no one missed call ringtone it's just a regular ringtone but it's a the uh, sound of him dying yeah, that's when, you know, I was, like, thinking to myself, you know, I think this is kind of like a red herring because, you know, you don't hear... We didn't even talk about the ringtone of the TV series. It's so weird. Yeah, it's it's very close, but it's not quite the same ringtone from the movie. Yeah, and it has, like, some angelic, like, oh, in the background of it. It's like, what? Right, they were like, you know what would sound creepier is if it was the music plus, like, children singing. And yeah, it sounds like something you hear in the End of Days soundtrack. Yes, yes, 100%. Um, <laughs> that's a really good call. All right, so episode three in our run here, it's uh, Sendo, um, you know, is listening to his, his death call, while Yumi is like, oh, hey, wait a second. All of these bodies had rose tattoos on their hands. That's probably a clue. And so, <laughs> right. But I like the fact that, like, you know, we were talking about before that Sindo and Yumi are this kind of X-Files team investigating this stuff. I really, again, I'm enjoying myself so much with this series. I'm so glad that we got it. Uh, yeah. So Sindo and Yumi uh, go back to the acoustics lab. Uh, cause they're like, Hey, Sendo now got this one missed call. We want to see if this thing's legit. And meanwhile, back at Yoko, my watch, our wacky team of reporters get a call from, uh, the head office and, uh, they, in theory, the editor says they are asking for help in covering all these one missed call deaths. And, uh, the editor says, Absolutely not. Either you are being used or you are using people and we are going to stand on our own. We are not going to get the, the head office in a, on our shit. Like this belongs to us. And, uh, shout out by the way, to an old friend of mine, uh, Sheila Lester, who 20 plus years ago told me the smartest thing anyone ever said to me, which was, Remember, you are always pimping or you are being pimped. <laughs> when when you have to pay the water bill, that is the water company pimping you. You just yeah. got to make sure that you, you are pimping something somewhere along the line. Um, uh, anyway, absolutely true. The older I get, the more true it is. Um, anyway, so in the midst of all this stuff happening at Yokome Watch, a letter comes in. The editor calls everybody around dramatically to look at this letter, but we cut away from that to to create some tension, Derek. Yeah. 
and we go back to the school where Sakaya is being questioned about how this rose got delivered to her. And she's like, I don't know why everybody's so serious and worked up about this. I mean, it's just a curse, right? And, and so she kind of takes off and like uh, her her counselors and the teacher and stuff are like, oh, it turns out she lost her parents when she was very young. So she's kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, which, as it happens, Derek, not true. But we'll we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, so there's this acoustics guy uh, who who gives uh, Sindo a message that hey this phone call you got total fake not not really your voice on on the call screaming and choking and Sindo is like well who would do that to me and uh, before they can investigate that Yumi gets a call from the editor and says we got a message from this killer this one missed call killer or I think they call it the death message killer or something yeah. And so Yumi and Sendo show up at Yokome Watch, and it's a picture of a girl with a note that says, I'm going to kill this girl next. And the next scene after that is that girl actually getting got. Yeah. Dressed to, dressed to kill style, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, there there's some business about, like, Yumi wanting to find the killer and... um. Yeah, and then uh, the girl's name, I think it's Yayoi, who gets the, the the call. And, yeah, she opens, uh, it, it turns out that the sound that she hears on her one missed call is the sound of an elevator dinging. And it's just a dude in a clown mask what walks into the elevator and stabs her to death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Sindo and Yumi are hot on the case turns out that yayoi did not have the rose tattoo yeah so that's when they figure out they're dealing with somebody who's maybe a copycat killer that's copying these yeah there's a real like he get uh, sendo gets a phone call from his own number and it's this killer it's a real like do you want to play a game detective uh <laughs> it's that kind of shit um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so they, um, they get a message with, uh, from the killer next with a picture of Yumi and Sendo meanwhile is like, Oh, Hey, we got, uh, some, we found a knife nearby and we got some fingerprints on that. So we're going to go catch us a subset, uh, a suspect who is this guy named Mitsui. But meanwhile, uh, Yumi, who has been threatened, is now under the protection of Yokome Watch, <laughs> who are just losing their damn minds with all this, like, ritual and warding off evil business that they're getting up to. Probably largely alcohol-inspired. It uh, is. Uh, but it's hilarious. It's and- great. <laughs> And so they get a, a call that's like, oh, hey, we caught this sus- this suspect, Mitsui. Um, everything's cool. They're going to go celebrate. And they get stopped because they get a call from a kid saying, oh, I got this death notice call also. Uh, this kid named Satoshi. And Yumi's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Turns out we caught the uh, the guy who's been doing all this. But I'll come visit you tomorrow anyway. And he's like, okay, if you're sure you got him. And they even changed, like, the front page of the Yokome Watch website to say, like, we got the killer. 100%, you know, <laughs> you know, th- this is our shark. <laughs> Absolutely no way. Like, there, what? Yeah, yeah, there are other sharks like this in, in these waters, not in these waters. Um, right, so they, they think they got their man. And then... You, Yokome Watch takes off to celebrate. Yumi is left all alone. And then she gets, sure enough, a one missed call ringtone and everything. And it says that she's got 13 minutes to live. And the message is her, like you hear uh, the creak of a door opening and then just her gasping to, to death. Now, I got to ask you something. Was the curse 
warning her that this is going to happen? Is it on her side? Because it feels that way. I think this is just a plot hole where this is the same bullshit. It's just that uh, this... I. I don't think so. I think I think that unless they they like explain this later, I think it's the killer. I just don't know why he would know to use this call. You know, but the thing the thing is the questions that is he says I never sent her a call. Oh, that's right. Maybe it is then. Maybe either that or the one missed call just got it wrong. But there's also a lot of question about like who she is. Who yeah, you mean really think she's is? Connected because she, like there's even like hints that she's a puzzle piece. So we'll yes. see how that plays out later. But right. I was just curious what your thoughts on it was at this point. Yeah, I I, I had forgotten the part where uh, the, the killer ultimately is like, oh no, I never called her. Um, yeah, that's weird. Anyway, yeah, I'm sure. Well, can I be sure? I hope that they pay that off in the, in the back nine of this. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so sure enough, uh, this clown face killer comes after, uh, they, you know, there's a chase and a fight. She whacks the dude, the foot with, uh, a dumbbell that's hanging around the Yokome watch, probably the editors, you know, doing some curls to get the ladies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, and the reason she, she kind of sniffs this out because she hits this dude in the foot, runs off. And then later she sees a security guard who's like, Oh, are you in trouble? Let me help you. But she sees him limping and is like, Oh, that's, that's the guy. What I hit with the dumbbell. Um, he's the killer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and sure enough, uh, she kind of shoves him down, runs away and Sindo has a pretty smart move here where he pulls a gun on this guy and the guy keeps coming at him. So he shoots the overhead light to put glass, you know, to shatter glass all over the floor and the, you know, barefoot wounded killer steps on the glass and is like, Oh, I couldn't possibly go on because of all the glass in my foot. Uh, and so they arrest him. And, yeah. uh, and sure enough, they, this is the point where the, when they're questioning him and he's like, oh yeah, I'm just a copycat. I, you know, it's a shame. I only got to kill one person. Um, and, uh, and that he didn't make the call to Yumi. And then Yumi is like, oh shit, there's a kid who called with a, an honest to goodness, one missed call death notice. And he's only got 30 minutes left. And Sendo happens to know the name of this kid though. And she's like, how do you know this kid's name? And he's like, don't worry about it. We just got to go find him. <laughs> and so that is where episode three ends. And then episode four picks up with them going to this kid Satoshi's place. And sure enough, his time is up. He, uh, this is kind of the move where he has a video camera going and uh we see like a door opening behind him and uh Sindo and Yumi show up um Yumi of course going ahead of him and they don't find any sign of Satoshi at all inside until uh they open up the closet door in another room where and it's a pretty good gag where Yumi opens the closet and you see like the back of somebody's legs like they're laying on their belly in the closet. Yeah. And then as she's like, "Oh my god, there's legs." The front half <laughs> of Satoshi falls backward onto his legs, uh all dead and whatnot. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's a good reveal. I liked it a lot. Yeah. It, it like the show is good enough about like, Hey, let me dump another scare on you. Um, you know, at least a couple, three, an episode to kind of keep things lively. Uh, and like I said, you mix that with the silliness of like the Yokome watch and how absurd Sendo is at times and stuff. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. Um, I like it. Hell yeah. So anyway, uh, Yumi of course feels very responsible for this because, you know, she got the call from Satoshi and then kind of blew it off. And, 
uh, Yokome Watch uh, gets the story of, you know, the sad tale of Satoshi. And Yumi starts to suspect here. She's like, I don't think this is a person. I think this is more of a something as opposed to a someone. Yeah, and Sendo's like, please, you know, like, really? Yeah, and even the editor is like, hey, we have been we have been ordered to stop working on this story, but the rest of the team is like, fuck that. We are definitely going to keep going. Yeah. You, you know, the editor knows a lot more than he does too. He's in, you know, even like earlier on when he first sees Sendo there, you know, he, he looks at him like he knows him, you know, he knows what's going on. You know, there's something in the background where we're not really revealed yet, but, I hope it gets paid off too in that sense. Yeah. There's a really good scene between Yumi and the editor and they have a couple of like nice moments where they just kind of chit chat, uh, throughout the episodes. And there's a good one where it's, it's him asking her, like, are you sure you trust this Sendo guy? Like, are you sure he's exactly who he says he is? Um, and that is real close to a conversation they have where, uh, he is the editor has this ring of keys that he says belong to all the ladies that, you know, mm-hmm. he can drop in on time to time. Cause he's a lover like that. Yeah. Um, and Yumi accuses him, uh, rightfully of like, no, 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 those aren't all the women you're fucking. Those are women you actually cared about and the relationship has ended and you just can't throw the key away. You know, you're actually, it, it's more about you being nostalgic for these lost loves than you getting it on seven nights a week. <laughs> uh, you know, so there there's some nice, like, I, you constantly, I think, get the sensation that the editor genuinely is kind of looking out for Yumi. Um, whereas Sendo, uh, I think he is, but there's also an element of, Like, maybe he's using her for his own gain as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, especially, like, I know we're not going to talk about episode six, but there's some episode six shit that goes down where you're like, yeah, he's hiding shit, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, um, at any rate, back to our story at hand. Yumi ends up meeting a girl uh, who calls her and she's been getting strange pictures for a few days. Uh, if you recall her conversation about one miss call, this is that where uh, Kyoko is her name is starting to uh, didn't get a phone call uh, instead is getting these messages and we see her in front of a shrine and her body starts twisting in the, the series of pictures. Hmm, I wonder what this is leading to. Right, this is the point where you're like, oh my god, are they going to go full, you know, one missed call? And it turns out they're going to go full, full one missed call. <laughs> yeah, this is the part where it really mirrors the movie. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for what it's worth, uh, the at, back at the school, the headmaster is is ordering the lab coat teacher uh, to be like, hey, I need you to sniff out what's going on with all this curse bullshit we're hearing about, um, and and stomp that out. And uh, meanwhile, at the school, there has been another girl named Yuri, and she got a rose also. And Sakai is like, you, that's not a real rose. You yeah. need to just be aware. If you try to like flaunt the rules of this curse, disaster will befall you. Yeah, this is like, uh, you know, I mean, I love all those like high school drama bullshit. That's why it kind of reminded me of Tomie at the beginning, where you know you had like Tomie in that movie, like trying to set things up. This is like kind of the same thing, kind of mixture of that and like the Whispering Corridor movies in the way. Yeah, where you know it's like high school drama one hundred and one. Yeah, so, yeah, and there's this kind of clear rivalry, especially Yuri is very much, like, looking down her nose at Sakaya and 
I think it was a little jealous of the attention she was getting and that kind of thing. And anyway, we'll get back to that in just a second. Because meanwhile, uh, Yumi and Kyoko run into the camera crew uh, that we're familiar with from the first movie who tell Kyoko, like, hey, we're going to come with us we'll put you on tv we'll get a shaman and all of that and she's like yeah of course and um so they find a note that has been left by satoshi uh that is a video that satoshi uploaded and like he it's a the the note he leaves is a code to log into this video site and it just shows him being kind of dragged away from the camera and that kind of thing Mm-hmm. Um, quick note here about G- Yumi going to the bar in this episode because she looks so down in the dumps. The bartender gives her a drink called the Corpse Reviver. <laughs> <laughs> I really dig that, man. Um, and uh, anyway, but the whole point of that scene is like Sendo finding her at the bar and her telling him like i really think this may be something supernatural and you know sendo of course uh kind of blows her off um we get a very argento like scene where yuri is walking through a parking lot and all of a sudden there's a dog there (laughs) that just starts mauling her while Sakaya, meanwhile, like stands by and just kind of listens to this happen. Oh, I didn't read that at all. I thought that was her fucking hellhound, and she unleashed that dog on that girl. The, I mean, that's the question to me: is is <laughs> is it her hellhound? Like, is she? Because in my mind, and and we'll get to it in a second. She is the the girl from the alps which we'll get to in a second i think that's who sakai is i think so too so anyway we'll we'll get to that all right so there's uh hold on let me let me uh, oh yeah so there's kyoko uh at the tv station finally uh, while Yumi is trying to figure out where this shrine is, Kyoko has a couple of funny lines where Yumi is like, you know, don't do this television thing. You need to come with me. And she's like, your advice is to stay away from shrines. They at least have a shaman, you know? <laughs> I, re- I really enjoyed that. And it happens a couple of times where she's like, what do you want me to do? Stay away from shrines? <laughs> It's great. <laughs> so, um, it turns out this is where we get into kind of here's what's going on. Uh, is that Sendo, uh, or Yumi tells Sendo, like, hey, I discovered that all of these kids' fathers graduated from the same school. And also, I think you know that because that's how you knew that Satoshi was going to be the next kid. When I, when I mentioned his name, Satoshi, you know that his name was, I think his name is Satoshi Kitamura. And he was like, I, that's how you knew, you know, what his last name was. And so Yumi rushes to the television studio along with Sendo because the time is almost up. Kyoko uh, is, is about to go on TV. There's another, hey, you told me to avoid sh- shrines and you suck moment, which I always appreciate. Um, and then the show starts and it's, it's that scene from one missed call where like she realizes, holy shit, this is the shrine from the pictures. The shaman gets blown away, uh, from, from the, the set. And then her body starts twisting up. We just don't get the head. Yeah. We get an awesome dummy fall. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's a pretty good dummy fall. Um, but uh yeah and there there's actually a good bit leading up to that where um Kyoko like Yumi comes in and is like Kyoko you're okay and they hug and as they're hugging uh Yumi and Sendo come in from the wings and Kyoko is like well who am I hugging then um and she also disappears for a second. They're like, oh, my God, where'd she go? And then, yeah, that's where you get the dummy falling from the rafters. It's it's quality. 
Yeah, it's a good, uh, you know, because they probably could didn't have the budget to do like a whole thing like they did in the movie. So it was a good like, you know, substitute. Yeah, I mean, again, for it being a much less expensive television show, yeah, totally fine. Uh, in fact, my note was this ain't Mike, but it's not terrible either. <laughs> yeah. So, um. But all right, so uh, after the death of Kyoko, the cliffhanger of this episode is Sendo being called to internal affairs, uh, meaning he's going to be all, pulled off the case. Um, so episode five, our final episode that we're going to discuss this time around, uh, we start with uh, the father of one of the the uh, dead kids, uh, Kyoko, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, Mr. Odagiri is his name. And after the death of his fa- uh, daughter, he's getting a one miss call death notice of his own. And uh, he gets dragged into another room and dies choking. Uh, but guess who doesn't know about this, Derek? His wife? <laughs> yeah. Who is at the hospital because of his, you know, the daughter just being twisted apart on television. And uh turns out she's a bit of a mess. Uh, but Yumi is is there to kind of comfort her a little bit. Um, there's a great scene where the editor tells Yokome Watch that they're going to bravely retreat uh, from covering any more of the curse stories. Uh, mostly because he's like, do you want this curse to rub off on you guys? Because I don't. Uh, I don't want to die for this. Yeah, but then the whole like Braveheart moment happens where they all, you know, Yumi's like, no, we must continue. And then Everyone joins her in the speech. <laughs> like, we must do news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you <Yoga Bay! laughs> um, it's Oh, it's so good. And uh, th- meanwhile, Mrs. Odagiri uh, returns home to find her husband strung up from the rafters, uh, which is pretty good. And uh, But then, all right, so immediately after this death, Yumi goes to her. And is like, hey, I'm really sorry about, you know, your daughter and husband and how your entire world was destroyed over the matter of, I don't know, about six hours. Uh, but can I ask you a couple of questions about your dead husband? Uh, namely, what about all these guys that he went to this university with? And um, it, it turns out that all of these guys 10 years before had gone on a trip to the Alps that was supposed to be kind of a day ski trip sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But a uh, the Katagama earthquake hit, and they were trapped with only a day's worth of supplies, and they were saved after five days. But after they were saved, like none of these guys talked to each other again. Like for years and years, they were sending each other christmas and new year's cards and all that stuff after this trip to the alps fucking stopped they everybody just stopped chattering yeah so the, yeah this, they definitely stole this plot line from peter strub novels you're right this is very ghost story yeah <laughs> um so um there's some business with uh Sakaya back at the school who is uh confronted by some of the girls who are like hey did you sick a demon dog on our, our pal Yuri. And uh, before that can get serious, Johnny Walnuts breaks that up. Uh, and after the the other mean girls leave, Sakaya asks uh, Johnny Walnuts, she's like, hey, so can you tell me what really happened 10 years ago? And Johnny Walnuts is, is like, I can't tell you. I'm not good enough to tell you. Uh, yeah so he clearly was in love with someone who died uh and i think that someone is probably yumi's sister yeah there's there's this weird love triangle where yumi wanted to fuck him the sister wanted to fuck him and now wednesday adam wants to fuck her yeah it's a there there's a lot of business like everybody loves johnny walnuts in this thing uh so yumi then goes to the father a a guy named mizono who was the father of the girl who drowned in the very first episode and she asks him about this connection with the group that they are the what they call themselves wonder forgel 
Uh, and she asks him about like, Hey, what happened on this trip? And this dude, not in great health, drinking like a fish, you know, like you do. Oh yeah. Has, has some emotions to, to drink his way through, I think. And, uh, Anyway, the father, Mizono, is like, get out of here. Get out of here. I don't want to talk to anybody. And as soon as she leaves, uh, his phone rings with the creepy one missed call tone. And then he coughs up some blood. And meanwhile, uh, Yumi is kind of filling Yokome watch in on all the what she's found out, like all this stuff with the Alps and Mizono and his disease. Uh, and he's like, hey... What if, you know, like Mizono kept telling me, like he he's in a living hell. What if that's the point? What if the whole I the whole point of this curse is to make all of these men miserable? And uh, the our nerd Oyama in in the Yukame watch is like, hey, by the way, I found this article about nine people being saved in the Alps, which means six kids have died three more could if if there are in fact three more children yeah and so yumi goes on the hunt for uh this you know whoever these other guys are she so she goes to odagiri's widow again and is like hey can you tell me who your your dead husband's buddies were and she's like no 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 they they lost touch but in all of this insurance paperwork he he left behind there's one envelope from an insurance company that they didn't have a policy with. And that sets Yumi on the trail to a guy named Saito. And Saito is um, a, a guy who says like, hey, I don't have any children. Uh, I'm divorced. Like if you if you want something to be taken from me that matters, good fucking luck. You know, I got yeah. nothing. Uh, which, you know, seems kind of, well, we'll, we'll get to it, but, um, then hold on, where are we? Uh, oh yeah. After Odagiri ends up dead, it turns out that he, he, it sounds like he was the one applying pressure to get Sendo off the case. Cause immediately they're like, you know what? Go do whatever you want. Internal affairs is done with you. You're cool. Um, and then we also discover in in this bit that Sakaya is the headmaster's daughter. Dun, dun, dun. Right. She comes in and she's like, hey, I'll help you investigate this Rose Curse thing. And he's like, get out of here. You're a menace. But I'm your daughter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. I didn't even love your mother. Get out. <laughs> right. And so we'll, we'll get to theories here in a second. But... Um, we also discovered that there was, in fact, uh, a mother and and child that disappeared uh, during the earthquake, but they were never found. And uh-huh. also, the editor decides he's taken a day off, um, and and has gone missing. So uh, after like Yokobe Watch decides that they're going to push through with the story, he kind of bounces. Um, we'll catch up with him in a second. Meanwhile. Uh, a nurse uh, has taken uh, Mizuno's phone and he's like, good, get it out of here. But sure enough, he hears it ringing as soon as she leaves. Uh, a phone, The phone is in his drawer now. And he just runs out of the hospital like a maniac uh, where he gets another message and it's like strained breathing and whatnot. Um, and then... He, he calls Mizuno calls the headmaster and is like, I can't live like this. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to this reporter. I'm going to tell her everything. And, uh, the headmaster then we know is one of these guys. Also his creepy daughter has to be involved with this whole Alp situation somehow. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a scene with the editor and Yumi. That's the one we talked about where, He's like, hey, are you sure you you know who this endo joker is? Um, and then Yumi hits the bar, 
And while she's there, the bartender says the editor who, who is, uh, his name is actually, uh, Sakuma that he was one of the best reporters that Toto publishing ever had. Yeah. And she's like, well, what happened? Why, how did he get bounced down to Yokome watch? And they're like, maybe he was just too good. You know? He asked the wrong questions to the wrong people. Yeah. And so we get a little bit more character that like, maybe he's a little gun shy that, you know, if the, if the brass is telling him to lay off a story, maybe his inclination is to lay off that story now, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, while she's at the bar though, she gets a call from Mizuno. Who's like, look, I'm ready to tell you everything. Come meet me at the creepiest possible place we can find. A cemetery. I think it's, (laughs) yeah. And so while Yumi's headed over there, Saito uh, hooks up with his lady where he makes the full mistake of telling her, I think I'm in love for the first time. And she's like, oh, my God, this is also wonderful. I'm going to go put on my makeup. And so she retires to the bathroom while she's in the bathroom. Her phone rings with the one that's called ringtone. And he answers uh, on her behalf. Apparently, nobody saw one missed call too, so it doesn't uh, kill him. But he hears her gasping, and later uh, on their way to like go have a day together, uh, she ha- starts having chest pains and stuff, and starts gasping. Um, and anyway, let's go. Let's let's catch up to the real meat of this, where Yumi goes to meet Mizuno outside of the cemetery at night with uh creepy fog rolling all around them and whatnot. And he gets as far as saying, you can't save me before uh, he gets his one missed call. And then a uh, smoke starts bellowing out of him and he turns into a skeleton. He turns into Skeletor from the Masters of the Universe movie. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. like he gets life forced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Yumi finds Sendo uh, asleep in his car and he confirms that, oh, yeah, even old man Odagiri had the rose on his palm. And then uh, she kind of tricks him into confirming that, yes, the headmaster was in fact one of the guys in the Alps. And so they're going to go talk to him and it turned, this is where we learn, Oh my God, Yumi knows Johnny walnuts and he's an old teacher of Yumi's and she, and he's like, Oh wait, you're the younger sister, aren't you? And she's like, "Uh uh-huh. Hey, why did you leave school? So suddenly and mysteriously 10 years ago. Uh, and he's like, well, you know, that's a long story. And she's like, great. I'll call you. I still remember your number. And he's like, you remember my number after 10 years? And she's like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. I'm going to fuck the shit out of you later. (laughs) Yeah, and Johnny Walnuts is like, I'll see you later. And Sendo's like, who the fuck is this dude? Right, right. Uh, So they go to question the headmaster, and they are interrupted during that questioning because there was some business happening in one of the classrooms. Where Sakaya is confronted by these kids who are like, listen, we know that you had something to do with the the dog attack on our friend Yuri. And it looks like a fight is about to start. And all these kids start banging on their tables like a Thunderdome is about to break out. Uh, she slaps uh, Sakai and Sakai starts laughing like. <laughs> yeah. And then all carry shit starts happening. A hundred percent. It gets total carry. Like the room starts shaking when they pull back. This is actually a, a, a shot. I really like where, when you pull back from that, all the desks have arranged themselves around Sakaya in a circle. And uh-huh. then she like carry telekinesis is tele- the door closed. Uh, as the kids are now trapped inside, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's a it's a total uh, Rorschach. I'm not trapped in here with you. You kids are trapped in here with me. <laughs> uh, and yeah, Sakaya just starts laughing menacingly as these uh, students are trapped inside, and Sendo Yumi 
and the headmaster are on their way uh, to see what the fuck is up. And there ends the first five episodes of uh, Chakushin Ari, the one miscalled television series. Uh, Derek, first of all, do you enjoy this so far? I'm digging it. You know, it's got a lot more mystery and intriguement to it than the, the second film of the series. You know, I kind of like that it's a little bit different because I thought, you know, I kind of like that it has like this different kind of like mystery feel to it. Where it's not like candies or anything. It's rose tattoos. It's like a bigger story in play. And I like that there's some red herring stuff, like they're actual red herrings where, you know, there's a copycat killer in like one episode and, you know, there's twists and turns and like even fake calls and shit. I kind of like that aspect of the show. Yeah. Yeah, it's I I like that it is a million percent Japanese. Yeah. I mean, it it just has that vibe all over it from you know, some of the fashion to you know, the absurd behavior of like the bartender who strikes a pose every time he pronounces anything. It's it's just the kind of weird that I love in in like Japanese TV and movies like this where it doesn't take itself very seriously. Um, it definitely goes for some scares and and I, you know, I, I'm probably not watching it in the best environment because again, I'm taking a lot of notes. So I'm watching it on a monitor and, you know, trying to kind of keep up with the plot and, and making sure I understand how all this stuff fits together. Uh, but if I were watching this, just kind of, you know, lights off in a room, uh, there's stuff in here that's real creepy that that closet reveal is real good and that tv station stuff is genuinely pretty good yeah for like it's actually a lot more higher quality for like what i thought it was going to be for sure yeah yeah so i know you've you've watched a little bit ahead of where we are but not too terribly far yeah i just watched one episode after this one so i know it happens after where we left off but I didn't get too far into it. Yeah. So I, my, here are my predictions and then you can, you can tell me if any of these are confirmed or, or denied in the next episode, which I have uh-huh. not fully watched. Um, so I definitely think, uh, Sakaya is the girl from the Alps. I definitely think Yumi and her sister uh, had a, you know, there, like you said, there's that three way love triangle between Yumi, her sister, who I, I think is dead and Johnny Walnuts. And I'm trying to think if there, and, and as far as big predictions go, it, I mean, obviously, like you said, it's the Peter Straw thing. All of these fathers, uh, you know, somehow or another, did some shenanigans that cost this mother and child their lives while they survived, you know, like they, they did some heinous shit. And so now the, you know, the curse is being visited upon them. Um, so that's, that's all I got right now. And, and also, uh, there's about a 300% chance that Yumi and Johnny Walnuts end up together uh, I'm sure that Sendo and the hostess are going to end up having some kind of relationship. They seem to know each other pretty well already. And then Sendo and the editor will fight on our rooftop. Yeah, I, I really want more story from the editor. Like, that's a character, uh, Sakuma, that I just think is, you know, kind of rich. I think a lot of these characters are, are sort of fun and interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, like we were talking about with Yumi and, and Sendo having, you know, they're, they're definitely flawed characters as well as the heroes of this story. And, you know, I mean, there's definitely cliches playing throughout this stuff, but, um, it's not, it's not dull, you know, all the, like you said, all the red herrings are fun. Um, nothing feels too egregious and, you know, I don't know. It's tough to recommend because it's like, well, you have to kind of be into that Japanese TV vibe because it's very much that. But if you're okay with those parameters, 
it's kind of one of the better television series I've seen, you know, the, the horror series uh, of that that kind of era. Well, I mean, it's, what, 16 years old now. It's not that old, but, um, you know, it's not like modern television, I suppose. Yeah, this is up there with, like, a, what the hell? You know, that manga artist had, like, his own, like, kind of, like, Masters of Horror TV show. Oh, the Junji Ito thing? No, not that one. Oh, uh, oh I know Ka- who you're talking Kazu about. Uzima. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did the doll. There's the doll one and. Snake I, Girl. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, I can't think of the guy's name either now. Damn it. It was I, like something, his name plus like Nightmare Theater. Yeah. I think that's the name. name of it. I'll, I'll I have see. it on DVD. I had to look at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. I'm like, well, I can go. I can go to the. Uh, the bureau upstairs um yeah i don't know we'll we'll get to it somebody will i'm sure somebody one of the listeners will be quick to be like listen you dopes uh the uh kiyoshi Uh, i don't know i can't remember yeah we'll Uh, figure write it down in the notes of this episode yeah on the back end of this we'll figure it out i'll I'll have to look at the library um but yeah, um, any any other predictions out of you that you know without spoiling six through ten? Uh, I'm not for them really, but I know that Yumi's going to play a bigger part because they've been playing up to it, and that's what I'm hoping that happens is the reveal of what Yumi's part in all this is. You know, yeah, she's so fun in this. She's I, I like I like the fact that she's real sassy. Yeah, that's the only thing that I'm curious on still. Like, you know, even after I've seen episode six. Uh, but, you know, there's some stuff that's going to happen that I haven't seen yet. So I'm curious. I, I hope that uh, Sakai uh, sicks a dog on her father or the guy <laughs> in the lab coat or both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, the fact that it ends that that fifth episode ends with her just going totally carry is truly one of the great like cliffhangers of of a television show that has pretty good cliffhangers yeah um you know the 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 one where sendo is like called into infer internal affairs the end of the fourth episode probably the weakest of of the cliffhangers, uh, as far as like, I don't care if he's in bureaucratic trouble. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know he's not going to be off the case. He's going to be fine. Um, but I, I did like the, uh, uh, the, the one where he gets the one missed call. I thought that was a fun one, even though you're kind of like, ah, I don't think that ringtone's quite right. I feel like if I were waiting a week to see that next episode, I really would have enjoyed that, you know? Yeah, for sure uh any other thoughts like we'll we'll do a wrap up for sure on uh on the following episode uh but any any big thoughts about this because i i feel like i've been uh just filleting it no nah, i'm digging it man for so far it's been great so far with all the ass i love like all the like little cliffhangers and stuff you know uh the ringtone got me a little used to took a little used to taking geek here because i'm you're so used to the other one yeah. but i'm kind of glad it's a little different for the show too because it makes it its own thing uh yeah i'm just very curious how it's all going to interconnect you know how they're going to connect what the ringtone means because that's a part of the movie if it's you know i want to see like little hints of that i want to see it's connected to the actual ghost spirit in some way uh yeah i'm just curious how it's all going to fold in the last five episodes yeah 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 me too so listen uh folks again thanks for uh doing the the lord's work of of getting this series to us um also if you have uh any any tidbits any information that uh you want to drop to me about the one miss call series like i said i'm still uh kind of on the hunt for a copy of the novel if it in fact exists that like this is going to end with me getting a cursed book <laughs> or like my my search for this elusive novel like that man was never meant to read or some shit 
uh, is going to result in me like ended up folded backwards in my closet. Oh, um, if only Bo. Oh, I'll only. die a hero's death, Derek. Exactly. You know, like but- honestly, if that's how I went, I'm kind of okay with it. Like it would be painful and all that, but if they're like, oh no, he got killed by a fucking Japanese ghost. Uh, that uh, it would, I, I would be a little bit proud of that. Me too. Yeah. Like my, my work here was not completely, uh, without merit. I got the attention of a curse. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> anyway. So thanks. Uh, you can drop me a line at Bo B O at Legion podcasts.com. Uh, and, uh, if you have any information, any requests, I've got kind of the next, well, actually the show is mapped out through about August, but you know, if you, uh, if you have a suggestion that is better than what I've come up with, I will certainly entertain it. Um, also the, like I said, the information that you guys have been sending is, uh, is terrific. I really appreciate it. Feel free to continue to do so. You can also find me. Uh, on Twitter and uh, on the Facebook at Legion Podcasts. Uh, and, and Derek, where can people find more of you? Oh, huh. well, as the listeners probably know by now from the last two episodes, most of my shows are on the Dark Discussions Network. Cinema Attack, they're here in No More Room in Hell. All various different shows, different formats, uh, a fun different co host too, on all three shows. So check those out, and if you want to check out my Legion podcast, where I talk about giant monsters and tokusatsu sci-fi movies and stuff like that, uh, you can check me out on Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. Underwater under Kaiju from Outer Space. <laughs> oh, is that your... You gotta sing that to me one day, Bo, off the air. But uh, yeah, just check that out, where we give you those visions from Monsterland peeps yeah it, yeah all, all great shows uh check out all that stuff um and as always derek i appreciate it because uh i love love talking about the these one miss call stuff with you i'm glad we came up with a great excuse to turn three episodes into five <laughs> yeah, i know like, we're just gonna do the three movies and then all of a sudden we got this show and you know we got five episodes now yeah yeah it, and it it was literally me like sending you a message like man i'm you know i'm five episodes into this thing and we can't we can't do all of this in one episode no especially like you know the little small time scale we do get to record and stuff but it's fun you know like i'm like i'm okay with doing five episodes of this yeah yeah but but like i said coming coming after one missed call like i don't want to get too far ahead of the horse here but uh, after we do the next episode, then there'll be one missed call final. Um, after that is going to be a couple of one-offs like, uh, Mr. Vampire is going to be in that mix. Uh, little, uh, shutter finally getting to some shutter, nah. uh, as, as well as, uh, the, uh, speaking of Kaiju, we've got a Kaiju, uh, run coming up with, uh, one court psyops starting in early august so uh, a lot of stuff coming here on hero hero go show thank you so much uh please rate and review where that is possible and i'll tell you here's the best thing that can help us honest to god everybody if you enjoy the show and you want to kind of spread the word uh there the share button uh is amazing like just throw it on your feed or whatever and say like, Hey, here's what I'm listening to. It's all you got to do. And it helps so much. Uh, and, and the show's been, we've been like picking up some, some listeners along the way, uh, which is really exciting. And, uh, you know, let's just spread the word until this weird Asian horror podcast is just quite simply the most powerful podcast in the universe. That's hell yeah kaiju size derek i want to be i want to be so big that they have to assemble the forces of godzilla rodan and jason statham and jason statham maybe even a join the rock johnson just to stop it i made that joke because if you haven't seen crank 2 there's actually a scene where there's a kaiju jason statham yeah (laughs) and and in fairness Dwayne the rock johnson rampage 
Um, I love that movie. <laughs> it that's a really dumb movie that I can kind of get behind. Me too. Um, yeah, I. It, it's not great. It's totally entertaining. Um, yeah, it knows what it is. That's why I like it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so 